as Simon had mentioned, it's a beautiful day out there today. Uh, and right now, monarch butterflies are actually making their way up the northeast right now. Uh, and we'll talk about that here in a minute as far as the great migration that happens with monarch butterflies. It's rather fascinating. And uh, doing the program at this time of the year, actually, uh, the reason why we're doing it this time of the year is because of the popularity and discussions that occurred l with last year's monarch butterfly program and that there was a really big interest in trying to prepare for monarchs. Uh, we did this in August, which is kind of just at the peak of, or last year we did this uh, in August and it was kind of the peak of caterpillar season and a lot of uh, participants were wondering what they could do now and it turns out some of them uh, were a little disappointed that it kind of missed the boat a little bit. So we're going to do this now so that way everybody can begin to prepare, watch their yards and everything for milkweed or possibly plant milkweed and kind of get uh, prepared for uh, the season of the monarch coming up. So that's really what we're going to be doing here. We're going to be covering a variety of topics all right, uh, with this uh, with this presentation, a uh, brief overview here. Uh, if you don't know what a monarch butterfly is, we're going to talk about that right off the bat so that way we're all uh, understanding what species it is that we're dealing with. We're going to talk about their migration, uh, the great migration, one of the great ones that's on planet Earth. And it's actually the only insect that does what it does, and we'll explain that in a minute. Uh, also, we're going to start to talk about uh, what to look for and when. And keep in mind that this is going to be mainly in central New York in the north east region of the United States. Uh, that's really where I focus on since most of us uh, are really, that's where we're at. So I'm just gonna talk about central New York region. Keep in mind that some of what will be talked about today will vary a little bit depending on where you are in the United States. Uh, in a nutshell, things tend to happen earlier the more south you go. Uh, things tend to happen a little later the more north you go. That's the general trend. Uh, we'll also talk about rearing caterpillars uh, and also some different types of methods, um, some things to look out for if you do decide to bring in caterpillars into your home or uh, try and rear them from a caterpillar all the way up to a butterfly and then of course release them in time for the migration. We'll also talk about various uh, citizen, science, excuse me, citizen science groups that are out there and then of course we'll leave some time for questions at the end. Okay. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get into it. So we're going to meet the monarch butterfly. As far as the monarch butterfly goes, uh, we're talking about insects, phylum arthropoda. Uh, they are part of the jointed legged, uh, joint legged uh, insect varieties with exoskeletons, order Lepidoptera. Ultimately, these are organisms that have two pairs of wings. They, of course, have a forewing and a hindwing. They have a head, thorax, and abdomen, and both their legs and their uh, wings are going to be attached to the thorax, which is the middle part of their body. Monarch butterflies are part of the family Nymphalidae, which actually uh, is a very wide ranging group of butterflies and have some cousins, uh, notably the blue Morphos butterfly, kind of the uh, poster butterfly, if you will, for the Amazon rainforest. It's a very large butterfly with nice blue uh, sapphire emerald or sapphire colored wings on them, at least on the outside. And then, of course, we have Danis plexippus, which is the monarch butterfly uh, that we're talking about today basic lifestyle that uh, really all of us uh, tended to uh, learn about <laughs> in grade school. It starts off as an egg, which is incredibly small. I'll have pictures coming up here in a minute. Larvae, which is the classic caterpillar that everybody knows. The pupae, which is of course what you can see up here in the top right hand part of your screen. Uh, that is, uh, in this case, a typically nice emerald green that often hangs on the underside of leaves, but you can also find this hanging anything from a fence line to garages and houses as well. And of course, you have the adult butterfly as well, which everybody knows is kind of an iconic butterfly of North America, which you'll see plenty of pictures coming up. The monarch butterfly is interesting in that it is really the only butterfly, it's the only insect on planet Earth that has what's known as a multi-generational migration. It has, it produces four generations per year, but what's unique about this butterfly is that, and really insect really, is that it will produce one generation about every, every month or so, and each generation tends to progressively move northward in North America. It's that last generation, the fourth generation that we produce up here in the Northeast and even in the Southern reaches of Canada, 
that will actually fly all the way back down to Mexico and roost in one particular pine forest in Mexico over winter, and then will then progressively move its way starting in about, about February, March, depending on the weather, back up to the Gulf states and begin producing that first generation. And then the migration starts all over again. As far as what the caterpillar looks like, the caterpillar, uh, as you see here, is the traditional uh, monarch caterpillar that we all know and love. Uh, yellow, white, and black uh, striations going all the way down the body. Interestingly enough, it's important to note that the caterpillar itself actually goes through five molds. It actually does shed this cuticle which is a very waxy, pliable type of exoskeleton. Basically, it's got a little extra water in it than a typical exoskeleton you might see on a beetle or a fly or something like that. There's actually a couple different stages in here. In the top right-hand corner, right up here, this little bump that you see, that's actually a monarch egg. Now, it's a freshly laid monarch egg. Uh, it's a little hard to see based on the scale here because uh, I don't have anything uh, like a penny or anything like that in the image here for a scale. But if you were to take a look at a at the ball at the end of a ballpoint pen, the ball on the end of the ballpoint pen, that's how big the egg is. It is incredibly tiny. Now caterpillars will hatch out of this and go through and uh, when they hatch out of this egg, they'll go through the what's known as their first instar. It's an entomological or insect way of saying their first molt or their first stage. What you're seeing here with the other two, right? off here to the left-hand side and down here. This right here on the left upper left-hand side is actually the third instar. This is actually the third stage of the monarch caterpillar stage. So they'll molt five times before they go into the pupa stage, into the chrysalis stage that everybody knows and loves. So they'll come out of the egg, they'll eat their egg and go through the first instar. They'll eat and eat and eat as is the caterpillar's job. Once they're big enough, they'll go through a molt and then they'll eat and eat and eat again. Once they get big enough, they'll go through their second molt and then repeat this process two more times before they're at finally their fifth instar. Once they've eaten enough and stored up enough glucose, they'll go into the pupa stage. In which case after the pupa stage, after about mm, two weeks, depending on the temperature, depending on the weather, they'll become full-fledged adults. Full-fledged adult butterflies, as you see here uh, on the uh, on this slide, uh, there is a little bit of what's known as sexual dimorphism, basically meaning that the genders do look different, but it is subtle. And this is often a question that I get from people. How do you tell the difference between a male and a female. Well, these two pictures will uh, hopefully alleviate any confusion. The male that you see here on the left, you have to look at the rear wings, not the fore wings, but the rear wings. This one's got it folded down a little bit, but you can still see the difference here. And it's this spot right down here on, the, on both the left hind wing and the right hind wing. This spot is actually common for all nymphalidae butterflies. For most all nymphalidae butterflies, it's actually a pouch whereby, as far as we know, it carries pheromones, which are colorless, odorless chemicals used to attract other butterflies. What's unique about this pouch in monarch butterflies, however, is that it is vestigial. It actually doesn't carry these. Uh, so as far as why it's still there, we don't know. All right, so, uh, so the male will have a spot. If we go over here to the right-hand side, you'll notice here that there is no spot on the female in the same corresponding spot as the male. So males will have spots, females will not. Okay. All right, so let's talk about this great migration uh, that we see here. All right, so as far as the great migration, we're gonna start at the beginning of the year, or beginning of the calendar year at least. So in January and February, most all of the butterflies, the four, that fourth generation was produced in the southern reaches of Canada and northern reaches of the United States of America, fly all the way down and they overwinter in a pine forest in Mexico. It's actually pretty south in Mexico. It's pretty deep in the southern parts of Mexico. Here is where they will overwinter. 
usually the temperatures stay above freezing. Now, with climate change changing a little bit, they have experienced some freezing events, which, yes, has damaged the population over years. But it is, but they are still holding on. So in about January, February, these butterflies are still covering over the pine trees and the branches and everything in Mexico, overwintering and hibernating. So round about March, again, depending on the temperatures, round about March, the temperatures begin to warm up in Mexico enough to where the butterflies will begin to start to stretch their legs. So start going through some fluttering exercises and begin thinking about heading north. Now keep in mind, insects have to warm up. They are not what are called endotherms, like humans and birds. They do not produce their own body heat. Right? They don't produce their own body heat. Instead, they rely on the environmental temperatures to help warm up their bodies in order to help gear up their metabolism to do their organismal thing, be able to move around, be able to eat, et cetera, et cetera. So round about March is when, the, is when these temperatures finally get uh, finally get high enough for them to be able to start kind of brushing off the hibernation dust, if you will, and begin moving northward. They'll begin moving northward and their first stop is usually along the Gulf Coast states. Usually Texas begins to see them first. And then of course, Louisiana, Alabama, uh, Mississippi, Florida, et cetera, et cetera. We'll start to see this progression northwards throughout April. Uh, typically in April, they're going to produce the first generation. Then that first generation will then move northward again into kind of the, what's known as the Corn Belt states or our Great Plains states along in Pennsylvania and Ohio and such. And then about May through July, they'll progressively begin to head northward more and more until about sometime in about May, they'll reach the most northern extent of their range, which is the very southern extreme of Canada that you see up here at the top with this dotted line. From here through about May through July and almost August as well, they'll, that, four, that third generation, second and third generation or so, will breed and lay eggs and produce that fourth generation. That fourth generation will really start to be seen somewhere around about July and definitely in August. It's not uncommon to see egg laying either at the end part of August and also early September as well. So sometimes you'll still see egg laying and even first and second instar caterpillars still being produced at the beginning part of September. That's okay. Um, it is a little late in the season and they still do have a chance to catch the migration southward. Typically at the end of August and early September is really when the migration, that fourth generation, will move all the way down through North America, down to Mexico, and hibernate and start everything all over again. Now, if those of you uh, that were at last year's program or those of you that are really looking forward to try and get into this and, uh, and be able to garden for uh, and garden for um, monarch butterflies, maybe set up some pollinator plants, or if you have some milkweed in your yard and you want to know, you know, how to procure that, how to, you know, really garden for uh, monarchs and prepare, or if you want to be able to uh, bring caterpillars into your house and be able to feed them and kind of uh, protect them and rear them uh, throughout this stage of their life. Here's really what kind of look for in central New York. Now, keep in mind, depending on the weather, and the temperature will ultimately depend on uh, when you're going to start to see this. Uh, even something as small as which way your field or your garden faces, either north or south or west or east, will ultimately depend on, will ultimately dictate when you're going to start to see plants and when things begin to ripen. In general, in central New York, in the Northeast, Around about early May to early June is when you're going to start to see milkweed sprouts. Now, milkweed is a very robust plant. We have a couple different types of milkweed up here in uh, New York State, but the two most common ones are common milkweed, which is what you see here on the left-hand side. Nice, big, broad-leaved uh, milkweed stalks. They will typically get around about three to five feet tall in some cases. The other type that we have is what's known as the other type that we have is what's known as swamp milkweed. Swamp milkweed is a little bit more tapered in its leaf, and the clusters of flowers tend to be a little bit smaller. 
when they just start to poke out of the ground, they kind of look like little footballs. When they come, uh, when they start to come out of the ground, typically the milkweed clusters right up at the top where the first milkweed leaf sprouts will tend to be a football shaped and they'll be relatively about two to three inches tall. From there, they'll grow and grow and grow and, and of course sprout out more leaves and flowers later on uh, to be able to produce a nice tall plant. This will progressively happen over the course of a couple weeks. Now, you'll see up there on the bullet point, it says mowing ends with a couple question marks. This is another common question uh, that uh, really uh, citizens ask in regards to helping their milkweed patch grow and be ready for monarchs. And also a question that frankly, scientists have been asking as well, because monarch, or excuse me, milkweed is a very hardy plant. It's actually rhizomous, meaning that you'll have rhizomes underneath the ground so they can start to sprout up and spread out really everywhere over progressive season. Now, the question is, of course, how often do you mow it? Uh, because if you're starting to see milkweed in May, it may not be in your particular area that you may not see monarch butterflies until August. In which case, if you let that milkweed plant grow, sometimes it already goes to seed pod and it starts to die off around about the end of August, just when you're starting to see monarch butterflies. Each area is a little different. Uh, so in general, the current research as of a couple of years ago is showing that you can, you can begin to and stop mowing somewhere around about end of May, early June. Uh, there have been some studies to show that you can go all the way up until about mid June and then stop mowing. Uh, your particular patch or your particular milkweed spot will be, of course, maybe a little bit different. There is research to show that the more you mow the milkweed, the uh, less hardy the plant is. So you have to find kind of a happy medium for your particular patch. Uh, I'll give you a quick antidote. Personally, at, at my area that I have a milkweed patch, uh, I've got nearly a thousand square meters of milkweed. I will mow that up until about mid-June. Uh, in which case, what I have found is that once I stop in about mid-June, that tends to be a good timing to where the milkweed are sprout up Monarch butterflies will come in, they'll be able to sip, sip off the nectar off of the plants and be able to lay eggs and there'll be plenty of food for the caterpillars to go around. Uh, but this isn't the same everywhere. So you'll have to uh, experiment with this a little bit. Around about July, we start to see plenty of butterflies uh, and eggs starting to appear. If you wanna go on the hunt for eggs, you can. They are uh, very hard to spot. Uh, they are green and almost translucent, so they blend in very, very well with the underside of a leaf. The female itself, sometimes the best way to find eggs is to watch for the egg-laying females. Um, I've found this uh, to be very beneficial uh, and actually rather efficient in trying to find eggs if you want to rear caterpillars from an egg. Uh, with the female butterflies, Keep in mind, and most butterflies, they will not let you get anywhere close. Once they see you start to step forward, they will flutter off uh, in an attempt to try and vacate or get away. Um, obviously, this is a survival strategy. Uh, now with females, what they will typically do is grab onto the edge of the leaf and curl underneath the leaf. If you kind of see that right here, bottom right hand corner of the screen, she will grab onto the leaf and curl underneath the leaf to deposit a single egg. You will egg per plant, all right, in the milkweed patch. So typically the more milkweed you have, the more eggs you may see. Uh, from here, August is really caterpillar season. That's really when you're gonna start to see the most caterpillars typically all the different instars, depending on when the females started laying eggs. And you may see caterpillars throughout August and even into early September. Uh, last year, I think I saw caterpillars really until the end of September, almost into October, which is kind of a rarity for my patch. But uh, with the way climate change is going, there's a little bit of research out there to try and figure out where is the monarch migration going and how will the monarch butterflies fare? In which case, spoiler alert, the jury's still out. Uh, as far as August goes, 
This is typically when you start to be able to collect caterpillars and rear them if you want to. You don't have to. Uh, I'll have a slide here as to why uh, rearing may be beneficial to monarchs here later on. And as far as September goes, again, this September typically marks uh, the beginning of the migration season south. So you'll start to see monarchs not in huge numbers in New York, but typically if you go more south, you start to hear or start to see uh, more and more monarchs grouping up and kind of flocking down south down to Mexico. All right. Now, as far as rearing caterpillars go. This is something that probably many of us did as a kid. I know I did, uh, I still am. So <laughs> I guess I never grew up in that respect. Uh, but we also, of course, possibly did this in grade school as well to watch the, the life stages of the monarch butterfly go from, of course, caterpillar through chrysalis and a released one as an adult. It's a very common thing to do. Uh, and of course, today there are plenty of citizen science groups, which I'll uh, illustrate three of them here coming up. Uh, that's really, uh, you know, have a variety of information out there as to the, the uh, benefits to rearing caterpillars and, of course, anything and, of course, uh, possibly some detriments or some side effects of rearing caterpillars as well. But there's kind of a fine line here uh, and what the definition of rearing is uh, for, and I'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, so the main reasons as to why rear caterpillars ultimately collect the caterpillars uh, from your uh, from your patch that you might have and bring them inside and maybe set them up in a cage and feed them milkweed. Uh, in some cases, it does prevent predation because yes, the caterpillars are predated on primarily by other insects, uh, especially things like uh, some uh, milkweed bugs uh, that are out there, not milkweed beetles, but milkweed bugs, uh, as well as things like parasitoid wasps. These are uh, uh, specialized wasps that will actually seek out caterpillars to lay their eggs either on top of or inside of a caterpillar, in which case when the pupa or excuse me, uh, when the uh, larvae of the wasp hatches out, it will is in essence eat the caterpillar from the outside in or inside out in some cases. Um, there's also a host of bacterial infections that caterpillars can get. Uh, there are parasito and there are uh, parasitic uh, flies that will lay uh, eggs on and in caterpillars as well. And of course, lots of different types of exonal death from say mowing and those type of things as well. Uh, it, ultimately will provide a head start or a boost for the caterpillars to be in a protected area away from any sort of type of bacterial or parasitic or predation threat that they may have. And of course you get to watch them grow up and then once they are a butterfly, you can simply open up the container that you have them in and let them fly off and do their butter butterfly thing for the rest of their generation. Uh, do I have so another question is uh, do I have to rear them and the, this answer is of course well no you don't have to it is uh, they will be perfectly fine really without help they'll be of course at greater risk for any sort of threat as we just talked about but uh, you ultimately don't have to rear them if you don't want to you can simply just enjoy them in your garden uh, and keep a watch for uh, where they crystallize uh, because they will crystallize on practically anything. I have found them on the side of my house, um, on fence lines, um, underneath the eaves of houses. Uh, I've even found them on my tractor a kind of couple times. Uh, so really got to watch out for those chrysalis because they will tip, caterpillars will often migrate well away from a milkweed patch and find a nice cozy spot to be able to crystallize. And that's where they'll be for the next couple of weeks. Now, are there side effects to rearing? There are there is some research to suggest uh, that fully reared monarchs. Now keep in mind that monarch butterflies can be reared fully in captivity, adults, eggs, several generations, and there are several butterfly farms, if you will, that do this on a regular basis. Research is finding that those monarch butterflies that are fully reared in captivity don't have the ability to orient themselves to migrate south. 
there is re ongoing research right now to look at the aspect of head starting caterpillars, what we had just mentioned, taking caterpillars from the patch, putting them into some sort of enclosure and feeding them milkweed to protect them away uh, from predation and parasitism threats. That's, uh, that is constantly an ongoing research to see if there is a side effect there. Uh, the jury is still out on this. Some research suggests, yes, they do kind of have a hard time orienting, but other but it's about other research is suggesting that they don't necessarily have a hard time orienting. It's something else that may be um, putting a damper on their migration southwards. But they are still finding butterflies that have been reared in captivity all the way down to Mexico through tagging efforts, which we'll talk about tagging tagging efforts here momentarily. So there's nothing conclusive yet, uh, but that being the prime word, yet. Science is always looking at this problem. Now, as far as rearing methods go, there are a variety of them out there. Uh, things to look for if you do want to rear caterpillars yourself, typically a large screen enclosure. Uh, a, a screen enclosure preferably because they do need plenty of airflow and plenty of moisture. Uh, with them. Uh, you can have a small screen cage, kind of like what you see here, right, uh, on the top right hand corner of the slide here. This is a small, actually a reptile screen cage that you can use uh, to rear caterpillars in. Uh, you can also use, uh, you can get these online as well. I don't know if you're going to be able to see that too much, but they also come in very large uh, mesh screen enclosures here as well, uh, which have a very lovely zipper door that you can place the milkweed plant in uh, and also be able to unzip just to let the butterflies out if you so need to. Uh, if you are going to rear butterflies, I suggest, depending on the scale or how large your operation gets, to maybe buy a few of these or build your own uh, because you are going to need plenty of surface area on the top of the enclosure for uh, caterpillars to be able to crystallize. Uh, you may need several of these because it can because a uh, cage like this can get very dense very quickly. Uh, again, that depends on the size of your operation. Um, anecdotally, uh, through my patch and what I rear every year, we rear on uh, I rear on average about uh, between 100 and 150 butterflies uh, per year at my patch. Uh, so I actually have, uh, multiples of these and my wife and I are now thinking to uh, just build an outdoor screen enclosure and keep them out there because we seem to be growing our population. So, uh, it really is up to you. Uh, you will need, obviously need a source of milkweed. Uh, you can buy milkweed seeds online if you wish. Um, or if you have a neighbor, or maybe if you already have milkweed in your yard growing up, you can also uh, collect those milkweed pods uh, later on in the year and simply scatter the seeds or plant the seeds um, out in your local, out in your yard or in your own garden patch. It is a very hardy plant. Uh, in order to plant it, you can simply cast it on the ground. Um, or if you really want to, you can just simply take a small trowel, shove it just, in a, uh, just about an inch or so underneath the dirt, shove some seeds in there, cover it over, and your job is done. Uh, the seeds may take another uh, season, so you, it may take one or two years for you to see sprouts in that area. Uh, there's some research to suggest that milkweed seeds do need to go through a freezing event in order to crack that seed coat and sprout up more milkweed. Uh, the other thing that you want to keep in mind as well is since even though this is very temporary, uh, you want to keep uh, in mind that you need enough time to take care of the caterpillars. Uh, a handful of caterpillars, maybe, uh, maybe even five caterpillars, five to ten caterpillars, can be quite an undertaking uh, for uh, some individuals, especially when you're going to need to feed them at least twice a day. You're going to need to feed them at least twice a day because caterpillars eat. That is their job in their life stages. They eat a lot. So you're going to want to make sure that you have a big enough milkweed patch to support these caterpillars and also you have enough time to do it. Uh, they're going to require daily feedings at least twice a day. Uh, now, in order to prolong uh, this as well, you can use uh, a technique uh, that a lot of uh, citizen science groups are using uh, today and actually use what are known as floral tubes. You can get floral tubes online. Uh, in some cases, they come in a very handy uh, little uh, test tube rack, if you will. 
And what they come with are these little vials. These little vials, you can fill up with water uh, and you can also pop the top, which is a nice little silicone gasket with a hole on the center here. That simply goes over the top. And when you make a uh, milkweed clipping uh, down at the base, you can actually stick the milkweed stem right through that hole and into the water. And what that'll do is keep the milkweed stalk that you just cut nice and uh, uh, nice and turgid, all right, through, uh, through its transpiration, through its photosynthetic efforts. And what that'll do is keep the leaves nice and broad and filled with fluids so that way the caterpillars can eat off of uh, the milkweed which will be nice and supple with sap which is ultimately what they're after along with the cellulose. So floral tubes tend to work out really well too. If you keep them in the test tube rack you can of course insert those right into the screen cage that you have and then just be able to replace the milkweed on a daily basis or so. The most important thing uh, too, is to make sure that you keep it manageable. Uh, through discussions with other people and uh, other uh, scientists, large scale operations can get rather daunting. Uh, you wanna make sure you keep it fun. Uh, it, having uh, a couple dozen caterpillars to rear is definitely uh, an undertaking. Uh, so, you know, keep it manageable for you. Uh, nothing saying that you have to have hundreds and hundreds of caterpillars. If you wanna just bring in one or two and just enjoy that life cycle, do it. Just keep it manageable for you so that way it's something uh, that you'll enjoy for years to come. Now, as far as um, other types of uh, other types of uh, groups that you can get involved with, there are literally a host of citizen science groups out there that all focus on a monarch butterfly, and in some cases, plenty of other uh, plenty of other uh, aspects of insects and conservation as well, if you're so inclined. Um, up here, the uh, Journey North, Monarch Watch, and the Monarch Joint Venture are three of the one are three very popular ones that are out there. The Journey North uh, is a great website. Now, I would typically at this point, I would typically take you to these websites. However, um, in an earlier test, um, ultimately the servers are not playing nice with each other today. So I will unfortunately won't be able to uh, take you to these websites to show them to you. But um, if you want to write these down, by all means, please do. Um, but one of the websites is the Journey North. The Journey North is a uh, website whereby you can go to and actually upload sightings uh, of butterflies, but not just butterflies. It has everything from when milkweed comes up uh, to even other organisms, uh, things like uh, red-winged blackbirds when they start to migrate north. And even if you're on the West Coast, gray whale sightings. So really anything in North America that has a migration pattern when people want to be able to see when are these organisms getting close to me so that way I can prepare, even things like monarch butterflies. You can create an account and be able to put a small pin on a digital map there when you start to see, say, the first monarch adult or say the first egg or say the first milkweed sprout, when the milkweed is blooming, et cetera, et cetera. And there are literally hundreds if not thousands of other people across the country that are also putting these digital pins on the map each week or each month to be able to illustrate when and where these organisms are going, all right, and when. Uh, Monarch Watch is another type of, is another website, another citizen science groups, and if you so wish, you can even tag monarchs. This is actually an image here of a monarch that has a tag on it. Now, for some of you wondering, how in the world do you tag a monarch? How do you do this without breaking its wings? Well, ultimately what you're looking at here is a sticker. The sticker actually has a special code down at the bottom. And this sticker weighs basically nothing. And it has super sticky adhesive on the back. You put it on a specific spot on the hind wing and then you simply release the adult. If you're up in the Northeast where we're at right now, especially in August and September, when you release that fourth generation, this sticker will hopefully remain on the wing and this individual will hopefully make its way all the way down south to Mexico, in which case there are scientists down there that will go through collection efforts to spot these tags, record the tag number, and then of course they'll put that into a digital database that will also be kept on the website and round about January or February, uh, they will actually put up there what tags they collected. So if you tagged one up in the Northeast 
you'll be able to go on and see if they actually caught it down in Mexico. Now, keep in mind that the, that this one spot in Mexico covers the in, practically the entirety or at least a good 90% of North America. So you literally get hundreds of thousands of monarch butterflies all roosting in one spot in Mexico. So if they find your tag, fantastic. But that if they don't report your tag, that doesn't mean that your butterfly didn't make it down to Mexico. It just means that they didn't find that monarch with the tag because on occasion, these tags do fall off in transit, all right? And then finally down here, you also have the Monarch Joint Venture. The Monarch Joint Venture is really a collective. It's a citizen science group run by scientists looking for input from citizens. But what it also does is have a repository of other citizen science groups, Monarch Watch and Journey North in included, with links to websites and literally dozens of websites all devoted to conservation, of migratory species and of course, monarch butterflies. Uh, and in, in many cases, uh, they also have of course, resources upon resources upon resources for individuals that are free to download, free PDFs, all right? So uh, what I'm gonna do here is actually stop sharing uh, my screen real quick and show you some of these resources that they have, which I find are rather fascinating, all right? Uh, especially for uh, people looking to get into this. Now just give me one second here. Technology's got to keep up with me here. Okay, I'm hoping everybody can see this. Uh, we're gonna. Uh, this is one of the. Uh, this is one of uh, the uh, pamphlets that they send out. But this is ultimately the various diseases that monarch butterflies can get. And, and uh, everything from your parasitoid wasp or parasitoid uh, fly eggs that you see here to bacterial infections and even things like uh, fungal infections. It goes through the life cycle of these uh, parasites and predators. Fungal infections that can infect caterpillars, not just monarchs, but other types of caterpillars as well. Uh, again, more bacterial infections and even viral infections that monarch butterflies can get. But not only that, it also tells you how monarch butterflies will also defend against these invasions as well. So it's a great resource if you want to know more about parasitism and predation. Also on this website has links to other websites, uh, one of them being uh, the Xerxes Society. And the Xerxes Society uh, is a specialized conservation, uh, insect conservation group. And they focus on pollinators and monarch butterflies. Uh, this is an interesting uh, free resource that they have. Hopefully everybody can see this, but milkweeds of the Northeast. So if you're looking for a milkweed field guide, uh, it's right here, it's a one-stop shop. So it shows you things like swamp milkweed and common milkweed, which I mentioned, but it also of course has other types of milkweeds as well. Things like your butterfly milkweed, all right, less common roadside milkweeds that you may have near your house, depending on where you are in the Northeast and so on. Things like poke milkweed, four leaf milkweed, et cetera, et cetera. Now, of course it goes through a little bit of basics on monarch butterfly life cycle. Now, as with uh, most pollinator insects, uh, monarch butterflies don't just consume milkweed, the caterpillars do, uh, but the monarch butterfly, the adults themselves, will be sipping nectar from a wide variety of other plants. Uh, another type of resource that you have from the Xerxes Society or the Monarch Joint Venture, whichever way you find your way to them, all right, is of course things like other nectar plants that monarch butterflies can have. All right, with this pamphlet, it's rather interesting, gives you some information in the beginning, but then it also is kind of a nice one-stop shop for other information about other plants that monarch butterflies will be able to sip off of, will be able to sip nectar from. Everything from, of course, your butterfly and common milkweed that we mentioned, but also other things like uh, asters, New England asters, uh, oxide daisies, uh, and a host of other pollinator plants. It tells you when they bloom, how tall they get, their water needs. And of course it has a very lovely uh, picture field guide down on the bottom so that way you can actually see if your, uh, if your yard or if your field or any uh, sort of local uh, area next to you has these types of pollinator plants next to them. So it's a very nice, uh, it's a very nice compressed field guide for those looking for just the nectar plants or uh, 
or just pollinator plants of the uh, monarch butterfly and other insects. 